In previous courses, we have seen in detail the difference between hubs, bridges, and switches. We also saw what a VLAN and trunk links are. The last to be seen on the switches is the spanning tree protocol. In a network, redundancy is very important, so as not to have a single point of failure. The downside of redundancy in a switched network is that it introduces network loops. This is why the spanning tree protocol was designed, in order to solve this loop problem. Network loops are introduced only when you want to have redundancy. In this diagram, if the link between the two switches drops, then the users on switch A will no longer be able to join those of switch B. This is why it is preferable to add another link between the two switches to have redundancy. But, as all, re as all redundancy brings network loops, now we have one. We will see why a network loop can cause a lot of problems. Imagine that the PC A sends an ARP request because it tries to reach the PC B without knowing its MAC address. And an ARP request is a broadcast. Switch A will therefore transmit this broadcast on all its ports except the one from which it arrived. That is, except for the port to which the PC A is plugged. The switch B will therefore receive two broadcast frames, as there are two links between the switches. Since this is a broadcast frame, it will send it to all of these ports except the one it came from. This means that the frame received on port 48 will be transmitted on 47 and towards PCB. And the same ARP request received on port 47 will also be transmitted on port 48 and the PCB, which brings us to a network loop. Since Ethernet frames have no TTL field, then the frames will loop indefinitely until the switches crash because they are overloaded with traffic, or until one of the network cables between the two switches is disconnected. This is where the spanning tree protocol comes in. Thanks to it, it will allow us to obtain a topology without loop by blocking certain ports. Now we will see how spanning tree works. In this example, we have three switches, represented with MAC addresses, which form a loop. As the spanning tree is activated, all the switches will send each other special frames that are called BPDU. This is what a BPDU frame is made of. There are a lot of fields, but only two are important at the moment. The MAC address field and the bridge priority field. These two fields identify the bridge ID. This is the information that the spanning tree needs to perform its calculation. To begin with, the spanning tree will elect a root bridge. This election is made by the one who has the smallest bridge ID. The lower the bridge ID, the better. By default, the priority is set to a value of 32768. It is possible to modify it if desired. So in your opinion, on this topology, what will be the root bridge? Well, since the priority is the same on all the switches, selection will be made on the smallest MAC address. And here it is switch A. It will be the root bridge. The ports on a root bridge are always tagged designated, which means that they are in a forwarding state. We will come back to the different port states later. Here we mark with the letter D the designated ports of the switch that has been elected as the root bridge. Now that we have found the root bridge, the next step in spanning tree computation is to find the shortest path to that root bridge. This path is called root port. Here are the ports that will be marked root port. It is they who have the fastest way to access the root bridge. The spanning tree looks at the actual speed of the interface to select the fastest path. Path. For example, it preferred to go through three links of one gigabit rather than to pass one link of 10 megabits. 
Each interface is represented by a cost according to its speed. To determine the shortest path to the root, we need to look at the cost of the interface. Here is a table that represents the costs of interfaces compared to their speeds. As you can see, the faster the interface, the lower the cost. It is therefore preferable to cross 4 gigabit links rather than a single 100 megabit link. Because the cost will be 16 for 4 links of 1 gigabit and 19 for a link of 100 megabits. Here too, it is possible to modify the different costs of the connections as well. From that moment on, the spanning tree determined the root brinated and the root port of the other switches, which therefore corresponds to the shortest path. But we still have a loop. It is therefore necessary to close one of the ports between switch B and switch C to break this loop. Which port will the spanning tree choose to cut? That of switch B or that of switch C? To make this election, the spanning tree will again be based on the bridge ID. As a reminder, the lower the value, the better. Here, as the priority is the same, the election is based on the MAC address, and it is the switch B which has the smallest MAC address. It is he who wins this battle. Switch C will block its port, which will have the effect of breaking the loop. The blocked interface will bear the initials of ND, which means not designated, not designated. And a not designated port is a port in a blocked state. By closing this interface, the spanning tree will solve the loop problem, and the port opposite the blocked port will be marked designated. We've just seen the basics of spanning tree. If you've ever played with Cisco switches, you must have noticed that every time you plug in a cable, an LED above the port blinks amber before turning green. When the LED flashes orange, it means that the spanning tree is determining the state of the interface. The port is in listening mode for 15 seconds. In this phase, it will receive and send BPDUs only. No MAC address will be associated with the port, and no data transmission is possible. Then the port goes into learning mode for 15 seconds as well. In this mode, it continues to send and receive BPDUs, but this time the switch is able to learn MAC addresses. Data transmissions are still not possible. At the end of these 15 seconds, the switch goes into transfer state. It is in this mode that it is able to transfer data, that is to say, to do its switching job. All of these steps therefore took 30 seconds to switch from listening mode to transfer mode, which is very, very slow for networks these days. We have just seen the spanning tree mechanism, but there is not just one type of spanning tree. We have classic spanning tree, the spanning tree per VLAN, the spanning tree rapid, the fast per VLAN, and the spanning tree multiple. Fortunately, it is not required to know all different types of spanning tree for the CCNA, but we will see next those you need to know.